everybody. This is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Today, I have a wonderful guest. Jackie Miller is a divorce coach, high-conflict divorce coach like me, and works with clients that are dealing with narcissists in their divorce. But today, we're going to talk about something that doesn't get talked about often, and that is healing while you're going through the divorce. Like, think about how stronger you will be if the fear wasn't sucking all your energy up every single day. Um, we're going to talk about the, the different obstacles and the hardest things that victims have to go get over, learn about, and heal from. So let's welcome Jackie and um, hear about how we should start healing now while we're going through it. And, and that can look at so many different ways from working with a coach, being in a support group, finding a community that understands and looking for your wounds that are caused either before the divorce that made you vulnerable to a narcissist or looking at the wounds that your narcissist like caused you, like that fear, that shame. There's so many wounds that we can start to let go of some of those things if we take a really good look at that. So let's welcome Jackie and we're going to get started and teach you how to get started healing now while you're going through the divorce. Because if you wait till the end and start and just be like, I don't have the mental juice to be healing at the same time. But imagine if that mental juice that you spent just a little bit of time working on some healing would make the process less stressful. Let's get into it today. Hi, Jackie. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Tracy. Thank you for having me. It is so good to have a fellow divorce coach here. And we're, we're talking like high conflict divorces and the people that we see are, you know, you really can't make this shit up. The things that happen to them are unbelievable. The journeys are hard. The lies are worse. The, the, you know, sabotage, the hiding things. It's, it's not an easy thing to go no. through years like this. It's not, it's not. And like you said, you just, you can't make this shit up. Every time I have a new client with a new story, I always say, oh my gosh, I'm shocked. And yet I'm not shocked. Yeah. But the, the stories just keep coming. Yeah. yeah. They're truly They're unbelievable. Heartless, heartless tricks and tactics that are used against them it's unbelievable. So yeah, it is. And so I know, you know, we had talked about before what we wanted to discuss today. And so it's so easy to remember going back into my own journey and after listening to yours as well, but, and then watching others go through this. And it's like, we have to find ways to try to heal from what happened in our marriages or relationships and all of the damage that's being done during the divorce or custody battle while it's happening. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think that they should be, or even can like split their brain. I mean, they're so into paperwork and depositions and, you know, all these things that they're like, you want me to heal now too. But you and I both know that if you don't start early, like you're losing years, you, you don't have to be struggling as hard during the process. If you start to get some things together, so yeah. they trigger you, so they don't anger you, you can you know regulate your emotions through the terrible things that are going to happen. Absolutely. It's just so important too, because it also makes you sort of start to focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, which like you said, there are so many distractions and bombs going off. It's hard to imagine you could even do that, but it's the perfect time really to do it. Um, and, you know, and to get the support you need to do that so that you can start your journey, your healing journey right away. Absolutely. That's what we're going to talk about the healing journey. And this is such an important part. I want to like kind of review a couple of things that, happen during a divorce, not the stonewalling, the lying, the hiding assets, not any of those things, because we know those, and they can see a hundred other videos about them, but these are the wounds that people have to heal from, and there's obviously things through the relationship, and then there's through the battle, right, I mean, it's, it's a whole nother injury to you, but like, for me, the people who see and find out that their entire life was a lie, yeah. like, how do you deal with that, 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 completely corrodes all your trust and everything you believed is just, you know, eliminated. So can you think of some other things, like worst things that happen to the people's soul, not actions taken on them? Right. I think it, 
can be so hard to comprehend that probably this personality disordered spouse, if you will, of yours didn't actually ever love you. Like you said, and that's part of the lie. And then there could have been other lies on top of that, whether it's they were married to someone else or they were, you know, it, the lies, 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 lies. And it, on one hand, I've heard people say, well, it, it's kind of freeing because I realize it's them, not me in a sense, right? Like they, they've got this disorder. But then on the other hand, it's like, how, wow, they didn't love me. And I, for me, that wound was, I, I just, I, I just couldn't believe it. Like I was going along in this marriage doing my thing and their mindset was nowhere near mine. When it came to like, I'm in a marriage, I'm part of a team, we're a family, you know, and then of course all this abuse is going on in the background that I realize now, but it's, you're right. For me, that wound, I could only begin to heal when a couple of things, I really started to dig in and learn about who they were and do the research and then learn what was going on with me that I felt that this was a good match when I got into this relationship or what attracted this person to me. And you and I've talked about this in past podcasts, but red light, red uh, flags, green flags. And it goes even deeper than that. We can look at codependency and whatnot. And I have a great analogy for that, but that wound of the lie, as you said, and then there was really no, they're not capable of love. Because it Did felt it really? like love sometimes, right? You're yeah. like, at a wedding, people danced. I mean, like, it just seemed normal. Where is, was that all fake? Like, right. it's hard to fathom. It is. And, and I think, you, you know, we, you talk about this so much in all of your material on your website and your new book, which is awesome. And, but many of us went on that journey of the love bombing, right? And it was so unbelievably incredible, better than we ever could have imagined, which is many of us know as part of the design, but yes, it was, how could that not have been love? It was magical. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's what most of my clients struggle with. You know, I, I have a girl that has been married for 47 years. She's like, my entire life was a lie. Um, yeah. you know, when you look at that sort of wound of like, it's hard to, it's hard to even come out of something like that, but it is possible. Both you and I know that it's possible. Yeah. So, so that's one wound. The other one that I see that is tremendous that people struggle with is the false allegations and projection. Like whatever they are projecting about um, and accusing you of, they are actually doing, right? And so, yeah. but we're still going, they know I'm not a good parent. No, I'm a good parent. They know this, you know, they know it. And yet, it gets thrown at you and then you, it's not that you doubt it, you just are more confused and just in this funk of how could they be telling these lies to people or the court system? Do you find that false allegations to be overwhelming as well? I just read a letter um, of a client's from her soon to be ex-spouse that was three pages long and just ranted and spewed and the most hurtful fabricated things you could imagine. And this is such a, a good discussion to have that we could go on and on about, but there's so many facets to this. Um, one, I, I like to point out to people when you were under their control physically, right? And, and oftentimes there was isolation going on with that over time and whatnot, but that they had you, they felt under somewhat of a control because you were in their space. Mm -hmm. And one of the sort of um, things, conclusions that we came through through our discussions is these allegations and wounds they continue to inflict via emails, through court, through, you know, their own attorneys um, alleging things, which, as you said, are, are basically confessions when they project. It's their way to keep you trapped still, but in your own mind, really, mm -hmm. because they no longer have that physical control. And so the more fear and pain they can exert mm -hmm. through these other channels still keeps you frozen and trapped in fear and in shock and in pain. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner we sort of realize that is just another extension of their control mm -hmm. um, and another way to wound you, it's like, now how do we isolate ourselves from that? 
now that we know what they're up to, but oh, it's painful and it can continue for years until we try to heal and learn what they're, and you know, educate, heal, educate, heal, learn what they're up to and start to devise tactics to protect ourselves and move forward. That's perfect. Again, the false allegations that people hear, they can internalize them. Like again, with that defense, I'm not a terrible mother. I'm a good father. I love my children. I didn't steal money. Whatever the false allegations are, it becomes your battle you know, you're, you're, you're defending yourself. So you can't really even like my group last night, we were talking about like, you are so on the defense because they keep rapid fire throwing all this shit in your face that you can't go, but what about what they're doing? I mean, it, it, it's, it's their tactic to really this false allegations. When you realize that you can either like fight the, the fact that they're calling you something that you're not like a thief or a bad parent, right? Or you can just go, I know the truth and you're not taking me down with this false allegation. So we, we could either become um, Velcro where all of this sticks. And in the beginning, every lie is sticking to your body and you are just in shock and, and, you know, it's, it's just overwhelming or we can be Teflon and go, yeah, whatever. I know it's not true. So I'm not listening to this rant. It's so right. easy for them to control the victim back into this place of defense mode. The false allegations, like they're not true. And we have to defend things that we have to defend, but not all of them, right? But we, we, right. we want to show the world, I'm not a thief, right? And we spend a lot of wasted money, but it's really the burden on them. What did I steal? Huh, I wish I had like thought of that during my defense. I was just... I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Right. Ching, cha ching, cha ching goes the lawyer bill, right? It wasn't worth fighting for. Why didn't you show me where I did steal? I never thought of that. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not sure there's actually a shortcut to getting there. I think that lots of us have to realize like you, you're in this court system and you're not sure how it works yet, right? The, in family law. And so obviously all these allegations come in and there is some merit at first to sort of lay in a groundwork that you can, that you have to defend yourself. But then once you learn, it is just truly a tactic to keep, like you said, keep you wounded, keep you um, in the state of fear. Then it's interesting how your strategy to deal with them, like you said, becoming the Teflon can also be part of your healing journey. Because what first starts out of, as you defending yourself now turns into you get one of these ridiculous letters that are so painful and so hurtful and just straight out lies, as you said. And it becomes, that's not true. I'm saddened you feel that way. I'm looking forward to having, reducing conflict so our kids, you know, can heal on this journey too, period. It's like, that, oh. That's the ninja power of. That's the ninja power. Right? You're just like, oh, I could have done that three months ago. Awesome, right? That's what we're here for, to help them see this and not let it stick to them as much. Yeah, yeah. And and within that, it, once you can sort of start those practices, you start to sort of own it and realize that you are, you can become somewhat impervious um, mm -hmm. to their attacks. And, and then it, it, it sort of uh, limits their control and their ability to put you in that fear. And phase. to trigger you right back into, into misery. So yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The next one that I want to discuss, which I think is like absolutely just mind blowing to clients is the secret life. Right. So whether it's a whole other family, a, a mistress or a, 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 you know, a boyfriend or whatever, um, or like they've been hiding money for 30 years, for 20 years, you didn't know. Um, and now someone's looking at your records and going, why is this happening? And you're just like, holy mackerel, they've been doing it for all that time. Right. They led this second life. And that to me is, is so blind, you know, mind blowing. What do you think? Of, I mean, you obviously have people with this discovery of, oh my God, they've got children with someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like you said, it spans from that, you know, cheating, um, the financial and to sort of be able to separate yourself and realize this is their pathology. This is their sickness. This is their disorder. Um, and, and I hate to say it's a double-edged sword again, it's because a, it's like they, they didn't really love you or care about you, but at the same time, you could have been Amy, Beth, Margaret, Lisa, you know, that they married and they would have done the same thing to them. So 
in this bizarre twisted world, it's not you. Yeah. It's not about you. And I know we have to sort of work through that to realize that that's almost a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're a sick individual. Uh, they were a vampire using you for your energy, for to be their, their, their front person, to make them look good. Um, and even listening to you talk about that, Tracy, I'm still a little triggered. I mean, we had a huge financial secret component going on uh, in my relationship. And uh, it was extremely painful to think I was doing everything to be supportive. Mm -hmm. everything to build this person up to go out and be successful every day, everything to make this family happy and successful and, and have this wonderful, you know, family so that you, you could do, and you were off squirreling everything away and hiding it. And, and then when the time came for us to split, pretend that, you know, I contributed nothing <laughs> to the family. And so it was very painful. And again, I, I guess just from my own personal experience, what I can say is, where it helped me to heal was to just really separate and realize that that, like I said, is their illness and problem. And, and I couldn't have worked any harder. I couldn't have done any better. I couldn't have been a better wife. I couldn't have been a better mother. Yeah. It's something they're going to do. They did to me and they're going to do to the next person. Absolutely. That's the part, you know, people also get into the, oh my God, if there was another person in, in your spouse's life, they're getting the better one of him. I put him through school. I gave up my job. I raised the kids. And now this person is getting the best of him. It's really not the best of him. It's just another repeat, like Groundhog's Day. Give it a couple years. The love bombing will wear off and they will be hiding and lying and cheating on that person as well, because that's Absolutely. what they do. And so in speaking of wounds, you're exactly right, because it is another way they inflict wounds is to have the new supply and show them off and make it look like, oh, but this was the perfect one that was way better than you and does all these things that you didn't do. And, you know, that again is intentional. And as much as anyone out there listening can realize it's all a new show. And even if you think back, I, I know for me, and I think maybe you and I've even talked about this before. And when I talk to other clients, Think back to who you were being weaponized to hurt. Mm. And I know I was being weaponized to hurt the previous wife. Mm -hmm. And so now when I realized that, it helped me understand, okay, new supply is just being shown off and showcased. Next, yeah. That's they're, and, and there almost comes a time in the healing process where you can even start to feel sorry for the new supply, even if they were having an affair with your husband for five years, <laughs> Whatever it was. but it, but no, really, I mean, yeah, on the journey, like, wow, next feelings, when you actually feel sorry for the next supply, as opposed to, I want to rip their eyes out. Like that's where you realize this is just going to cycle. This wasn't me. So it is almost a good thing when you actually find empathy. Now, sometimes the next supply is, you know, absolutely ridiculous and teams up with them and does things that are even worse. So but, true. Yeah. So it, you, you know, you may never have empathy for them. So it's, it's a spectrum, everybody. This is not necessarily <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to have this. No. But again, every single situation is different. Some will have it, some won't, but it's, it's, really just there's so many wounds that get inflicted on us and this next one I want to talk about really quickly is the co-parenting things that happen to sabotage your relationship with the kids to turn them against you to uh, call the police or social services right that all of these things like even post-divorce this happens and goes on and on and you're like will it ever end and that is such a huge wound because for those that have this unfortunate, you know, person that's going to pull this kind of stuff, they don't care about your kids. They're fighting for them, but they're destroying you as the parent, male or female, right? It doesn't matter. They're going after you for blood. And who's the one that's going to be hurt is the children. So you're sitting there, mama bear, papa bear, you know, good parent. And now you're having to like deal with your little children going, you're so mean, mommy, daddy says you're, you know, you're mean and you're causing this divorce and it's all your fault. And they're five years old, you know, using the kids as a weapon is such a huge wound for people in a divorce situation. Oh, they, uh, these 
personality disordered individuals have no problem using little kids as a weapon, as you said, and it is truly one of the saddest things mm -hmm. I have seen, and I'm sure for you too. Um, I, I can't say enough on this topic. I will say for victims of this kind of abuse, uh, just number one piece of advice is get as much support as you can. Mm -hmm. And again, this healing can feed into strategy as well if you're in ca caught in this cycle. But it you know, can be obviously therapist for yourself, therapist for your children, um, you, you know, hiring divorce coaches or, you know, custody coaches, hi, um, you know, making sure you have the right attorney, um, just joining support groups, joining Facebook groups. I know you talk about this a lot in your book and, and on your website as well, but ask for help. Um, talk about it with girlfriends, um, you know, uh, just get as much support as you can because it's so painful. It's so painful and it's just, it almost feels like just bullets coming one after another and you can never really get past it because they keep on sabotaging you. You say no, all of a sudden the kid walks in with a brand new iPhone. You're like, no, we said no, wait, what? you know, you, you just are always in that battle. And we've talked about a couple of wounds here or a couple of things that we see commonly. Um, but the, the emotions that people struggle with, and then we'll get to the healing part. But for me, it's fear, right? They are just bottlenecked with fear. And it's maybe fear of the future, fear financially, fear of that co-parenting situation, fear of the unknown. I've lived in the same house for 30 years and now I don't know where I'm going, right? Things like that. Also, I find trusting again, trusting themselves is first and they just you know, after you've just learned your whole life was a lie, it's really hard to trust yourself, right? Um, I think anger is the other thing that they definitely get angry at the narc for, you know, what they're doing or did, um, or angry at themselves for the wasted years, not seeing it, staying so long, you know, they internalize it and it, it just metastasizes. It's not a good thing. I think unworthiness, um, they're not worthy of being happy. Um, shame is a big one. So yeah. tell me, do you have any other things that you see commonly that they've got to work on? It's, as you said, I think fear is probably um, the overarching emotion that, that, you know, is the one common thread throughout it. And of all the fears that you named, I think there's one that encompasses them all, which you said was fear of the unknown. They sort of all boil down to that. And so when you are stuck in a situation, high conflict with an individual that literally, I was telling a group the other day, there was a point in my divorce, I didn't know if he was going to drive a car through the front of my house or drop off the face of the earth and leave me with their children. We never see him again. And any bizarre idea you could come with, come up with in between those two, literally, I had no idea. And when your brain is trying to figure out solutions operating in that environment with that level of fear of that level of the unknown, mm -hmm. it, it can drive you crazy. And so it all boils down to what do you have control of? And I remember a moment in time when I literally said, I have zero control over what this person's going to do. Mm -hmm. And it almost became an out of body experience where I was like, Oh, and it was a little, it was liberating to be honest with you, Tracy, because I realized I have no control over what they were going to do, which leaves me with, what do I have control over? Mm -hmm. No matter what's thrown at me, I am going to put on my best face for my kids. Um, if they come at me with hate that's being filled in their heads, I am just going to have as much love as I can. I can control that. Um, if they're spewing lies and things about me, I am just going to be as sincere and calm and hopeful as I can. Um, and I can only control what goes on in my head. So if lies and documents are being said um, about me, I am going to look at them as opportunities or at how sick this individual is for being able to write these things and do whatever I can to shift my mindset mm -hmm. because otherwise I will be stuck in this fear because they will throw everything, including the kitchen sink at you. And you're absolutely right. That fear of the unknown is where they want you. And it just, um, it, it, it can ruin you. And I'm sort of a nerd that really loves to look at the science behind this. And so I really like to dig into this because I think if we understand also what it's doing to our bodies, maybe there's even a little more incentive mm -hmm. to sort of rectify it. And also knowing that, 
you know, there, there, there's more science that MIT has put out. And there's a great book um, by Jeffrey Schwartz, um, and it is called um, The Mind and the Brain. And it talks about how we do have control over creating negative pathways in our brain. Mm -hmm. And guess what the good news is? We can create positive pathways, but we have to make a super conscious effort, which is difficult to have fearful thoughts changed into hopeful, positive, grateful thoughts. And we can actually create pathways and change our brain. And I do believe it can affect our outcome. And that is what we can control. Absolutely. For me, I find that people that are just riddled with fear and they go, well, what are you afraid of? What, what is it? It's almost like there's this giant bubble of fear and then you go, what is it exactly? And they, they, they don't know. It's like, you have to sit there and look and go, okay, what's the reality? Let's say I'm afraid I'll have nowhere to live. I'll lose my kids. Whatever your fear is, ask yourself some questions what's the, the, the truth in that? You know, are you a bad parent? And would you lose your, why would the court take your kids away, right? You look at the, the actual re, thing that you're fearful about and ask yourself a lot of questions like, am I afraid of this? Is this possible happened? And what if it happens? What would I do then? Plan for the fear. And it takes out all the sting because you're like, I got a plan. Yeah, if they do this, I know what I'm going to do. So go ahead. You know, it helps you take the, 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 pain out of that fear by looking at it instead of hiding from it or staying there just like this big fear bubble but if it's two or three things we can battle it a lot easier than the whole I can't leave my house I'm so afraid of everything right let's let's wean that down to a point where we can chip off a little of that and take those fears away and then look at the ones with some realistic eyes and go okay yeah if that happens I'll still be okay Oh, right. Instead of, oh, absolutely. And and I think I read this in your book too. And I love that you have the um, notebook that comes with it because you can write out, like you suggest, what exactly are those fears Mm -hmm. and what is the worst case scenario? And I do remember doing that at one point saying, okay, if, if the goal from the opposing side is financial ruins. So I have not a roof over my head, not a morsel of food to eat. What do I do? And it was I go with my live with my sister and she'd be happy to have me. That was my scenario. I would survive. Okay. Okay. Guess what? I just realized that if their big goal in life is to ruin me financially so I have nothing, I'll be in my sister's attic for a few months. And guess what? She has a job for me. And guess what? I will make money and get back on my feet. I'm a smart person. I'm a resourceful person. Mm-hmm. And, and then when you go and ask your experts, ask your attorney, ask your, and they most likely are going to go, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you're going to be okay. I know, but it's just, it's just the voices <laughs> that you're hearing from the, the narc that yeah. just like boils your blood and makes you so afraid. I, I don't know about you, but I have so many clients, including myself, that like, we're so afraid that something, like, they were going to hire someone to kill me. Like, I mean, yeah. that's how I felt. I, there was no evidence or proof, but that fear was there. Like, they hate me this much. Oh, my God, right? But a lot of clients go through that, right? And it's just this unknown fear. Again, put it in that bucket. But the realisticness of it happening is, you know, not high. There's a small percentage that it happens to. And yet so many clients in this situation go right there. So we have to talk them down. I I say like, you know, when you go to the hospital, what's your pain level? There's like a smiley and a happy face. And you're like, and the bad one to 10, you know, what is your, your fear level? Are you all the way over here where you can't leave the house or can we dial that down so that it's not as big of a thing for you? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's just interesting kind of going back to my nerd science side, but we have evolved so quickly as a society and culture, not necessarily like, do we need our pinky toe anymore? We're no longer growing one, but, but in terms of what fears are today, like losing your job, right? Like, uh, you know, um, you know, a bad divorce. Like, so those are fears versus right caveman. There was a bear chasing me. So because it's hardwired in us and our body is constantly looking for dangerous situations. I mean, you could be at a dinner party where you overhear another husband say something rude to his wife and it will trigger you because that happened to you once. And think about you're at a dinner party. You're having a visceral physical reaction to overhearing somebody else. Are you really in danger? No. Is this even happening to you? No, but your brain goes, I've heard that before and it hurt. 
we're in pain, run. We don't like this. So we now sometimes, so this hardwire survival thing that, you know, all of us humans have have inside of us is sort of backfiring in our current culture. And our only way out of it is to think through it Mm -hmm. and try to to calm it down with rational thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, but it's good to realize what's happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like you said, and, and really our only way to deal with it is to think through it and realize what really is this fear? How bad is it truly? Who who have I asked to see if this is really possible? Um, what is the worst case scenario? Um, and then it's a marathon. Mm-hmm. And like you said, especially with the kids, mm-hmm. deep breath. We're going to buckle in and realize what we control. Right. We're not going to change it tomorrow. But guess what? We, we can, and we have people out there that want to help us. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's there's just so much work. I mean, for me pick up a book. You know, I probably got five fear books on the wall. If you're riddled with fear, go and watch The Gift of Fear and go listen to uh, Feel the Fear and do it anyway. Just sit there and go, oh, there's things I can do instead of like letting that sit on me. And again, we're talking about being able to do those sort of things while you're going through the process. Imagine how much more free your life will be when you're not ruled by fear. And again, you're still going to have to go through the steps. You're still going to have to talk to lawyers and depositions and forensic accountants and all the other crap, but you're not going to be in that place. It's going to almost be like you're watching it like an eagle looking down. It's not like you're, oh, you're sitting here going, okay, and we'll handle it. We got a plan. We're good, right? Instead of letting it envelop your entire body. Right. And then I think finding the tips and tricks that work for you. I mean, I know I'm a really big proponent of visualization. Um, It, A, it gives your brain a little vacation. I think it's super important when we're mired in just focusing on constant negative. You're constantly documenting all the negative things the other side is doing. You're constantly defending against all the negative things they claim you're doing. You have to live in this legal negative world every day. And it's so important to find some sort of mental vacation. And so what is it for you? Uh, I mean, I was re- researching this the other day and I kept coming across um, suggestions that said, go outside, go outside, mm-hmm. be outside as much as possible. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I think, I do think that there's some truth to that. If that's something that, that works for you, it's easy for you to do, go outside, obviously exercise, obviously breathe. Um, for me, again, it's visualization. Think about a future, what you want it to look like, where you are happy and peaceful, what, and spend time visualizing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and work towards that dream, right? And then work towards Everything that dream. Everything that you do is through that lens. This is my goal. I'll be there soon. Instead of that's never happening, right? That's a negative thought that's going to keep you trapped. I yeah. can't get my way out of this, but to go, that's what I want. And just take that deep breath and go, okay, I'm working towards that. Everything is with that goal in mind. And then you actually achieve it a lot faster than those that go down the rabbit hole and don't start till it's all over and then go, okay, now I'm done with that. Now what? Right. Yes. And then they're like treading water to catch up because they still have all that emotional baggage. So letting go of some of that and then whoop, now I can start my new life. Um, right. Right. And I think it's, I call it like um, the drive, sort of the driving mentality. So because you're so focused on the next hearing, right. And you are, you know, want um, a two, two, three custody and they're trying to get week on week off and your kids are really little and that's going to be horrible. Right. And so of course you're thinking about that all the time. Like, oh my gosh, what if, what if he or she wins and gets the kids a whole week at a time and I have to go a whole week without seeing my two-year-old. Are you kidding me? And so those scenarios understandably are stressful. You're very worried about them. It kind of reminds me of learning to drive. And at least for me, I remember gripping the wheel really tight and looking for the white line. And I was trying to make sure that the car just stayed between the white line and yellow light, like while I was driving. And then someone taught me, if you look up and look down the horizon Mm -hmm. and see, look at where you're going, actually it takes care of itself. As you drive the car, you just sort of naturally keep it between the lines with much less effort. So don't forget to have that long-term goal, envisioning you and your kids. I don't know what the schedule is, but you're playing on a beach somewhere or in a park and you just have this peaceful feeling that your kids are happy and you're happy. 
you know, and then for me personally, I like to get super detailed with the visualization. What are you wearing? Where is the park? Where is the beach? How old are your kids? What do you, you know, and really believe that that it's happening and have that visualization. And that is your down the road goal that will, that will keep the car between the lines with much less effort. Because I know you have to go to that hearing and try to get your two, two, three schedule, not your week on week off. It has to happen, but try to give yourself that vacation of this is all going to work out. Absolutely. That's like the biggest thing is really, if you want to heal, don't get, don't let yourself be stuck in today in the drama. It's, it's sort of start to plan and then the ease and the, the letting go of the fear and building trust in yourself. Like we build trust in ourselves by learning about narcissists, like the fear of I'm going to do this again, or oh, I want to do this again. Right. But if you think about it and you just go, all right, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to work my way through it. You do end up in a much higher place that you can start to recover from. Absolutely. And I, I think, like you said, learning about not only why they are who they are or how they became whatever it is for you that helps you just understand it. Um, it doesn't necessarily change anything, but lots of times just understanding what happened and what happened can help you sort of move on. And then as we touched on before, and I love in your book, because you allude to that too, like what part did I take mm -hmm. in it? And I remember there was a time and I thought, I am just this really nice person. I really didn't take it. Like he's just a jerk and an asshole, excuse my language. And what, what part did I play in this? As you learn, and, and I really started diving into codependency. And then I stumbled the other day on just dependent personality disorder, which is interesting. Go look that up. But it, I thought of it as almost like puzzle pieces. So if, if you're this sort of giving soul, really super nice person that is the puzzle piece that has that sort of outward jetting out piece on your puzzle. And they're the one that has the big inward piece in your piece. You're giving, 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 giving. And they're more than willing to take, take, take. In fact, they're looking for you. Mm -hmm. And they're just going to take. And you and you are giving. And there is something in you looking for someone, whether you know it or not, with a giant hole mm -hmm. that's going to suck you in and take it all. And you need these really nice, super giving people, empathetic people, which are awesome, and maybe end up in these relationships, AKA me, <laughs> and if you sort of need to look at, okay, is this a lack of boundaries I'm having, even though I'm this nice person, what is it in me that needs to go sort of fix or fill this hole for these people? And I didn't realize that's what I was doing. And I was. Yeah. And so I'm sort I sort of look at it now as like, you kind of want to be the straight edge side of the puzzle piece where you go find somebody where it's straight, or at least his fluid. Yeah. 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 And it's, you're not filling up the hole and they're sucking it all out of you. Absolutely. That was a really good way. I'm going to always use the puzzle. <laughs> I actually have a giant puzzle piece. I'm like, where's my giant puzzle piece? I have this big puzzle piece that I hold up sometimes. Um, but that's a, a really good analogy. And again, it's different for everybody, but we have to face these things. And you and I can talk about this all day long. Is there anything that I missed that we want to just do a quickie talk on before we have to go? You know, I just want people to always have hope. There really is hope because that's when, you know, I'm sure you remember, I remember we, the clients we deal with that fetal position. And I know we keep coming back to the fear and you just need to know that there is a support system and there is hope and you do make it through to the other side and trust your instincts. And you are a smart, wonderful, amazing person. And that's why you were targeted to begin with, but um, there is hope it's going to be okay. Yeah. Thank you. That is perfect. That, that's what everyone has to understand is, is go from hopeless to hopeful yeah. and then have hope, right? Yeah. I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to get there. I always say the difference between hope and faith is faith. I don't know how it's going to work, right? Surrender to, I don't know, but I believe I have the hope that it's going to happen instead of just going, it's never going to happen because you're, that negative thought is stopping you from taking the step and, and stopping you from so many places. So try out the hope thing and it, it, just be hopeful, start there. Like, yeah. I don't know. And, and I'll have the faith that I'll get there if I do my work. And again, looking inwardly is such an important part. You know, we don't want to go victim blaming. It's your fault. You're a codependent. 
but it's a wound that if you don't fix it now, you're going to get sucked up by another one. And that's what happened to me was I didn't know I had wounds of codependency, people pleasing, no boundaries. I had so much to learn. I thought, I'm just so nice and I'm so helpful. Right? Like, I what did I do wrong. I'm so kind. I'm doing everything. What do you mean? I'm doing 99.7%. I thought it was, you know, okay, but that's my role. No, we, we have some kind of accountability. If it's our childhood wounds, if it is something, don't be afraid to look at your own self and go, wow, I, I'm a negative thought pattern. Like I, I can pop it out like that. Well, learn to fix that. Learn to control that if that's the way you go. But if you are not looking at yourself, I don't think that healing can really come. And again, are we saying there's something wrong with you? No, but there's a vulnerability and there's also wounds that, as we discussed in the beginning, are now a byproduct of the relationship where you were in. If you're fearful, learn to put that fire out. If you are, you know, not trusting, learn what it means to trust. What's your criteria to trust somebody? People are like, I don't know. Hi, nice to meet you. Learn those wounds and then start to build trust by thousands of trustworthy moments, not just, hi, how are you? I trust you heal that stuff and to everybody out there thank you so much Jackie for being here today I know that you are a wealth of information and this was a great conversation I hope that people get a lot out of it and can you just tell them where they can find you your name is going to be across the bottom of the screen and your URL but absolutely uh you can find me at jackiemillercoaching.com I also have a podcast called uh out of crazy town your guide to divorcing a narcissist of which uh, Tracy Malone has been a guest before and will be again. <laughs> um, but you, you can go to outofcrazytown.com as well and find the podcast. And I'm, you know, here to help out with coaching in any high conflict divorce or custody battle. That's what I do. I just want to support others going through this, this difficult journey. Thank you so much for having a, a great discussion with me today and I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks for having me, Tracy. Take care. Wasn't she awesome? We have been friends for several years, done a bunch of podcasts together, and I think she's brilliant. And um, come from a place of knowing it to help you get through it. And when we help our clients, like we see what we can do for you and how to get you through this funnel of torture going through a divorce with a narcissist. So if you are going through a divorce with a narcissist, don't forget to find my book, Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. It's a full on, lots of information, lots of strategies to deal with these emotions, as well as the legal things, what to expect, what to do, how, how to have strategies to make it to the other side. You can find it on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Kindle, and hopefully soon the Audible will be approved and out there for you. But divorcing your narcissist, you can't make this shit up. I will see you soon. This is Tracy Malone. Have a great day.